All right, boys, you guys have been in the entertainment industry, the fashion industry for quite a while. What's the most toxic part of the fashion industry? The way they talk. The most toxic part? There's a lot. So before I, I got into it, I was like very naive, you know, especially in the retail. Um, and I started off from doing uh, streetwear sneakers before I got into like luxury fashion. And I think because starting from sneakers and, and streetwear and finding out the politics behind it, it steered me away from, from that and into the luxury fashion. Um, it's just a lot of uh, monopoly, um, even now, you know, like in fashion, there's a, the most toxic thing is people like just want monopoly of the brands. Um, they want to shut down other like com like retailers and businesses. You know, they want they don't want people to share the same collections. Blah blah blah. It's just very toxic in a way. Um, so if you say, for example, uh, you want to get this brand, and so you have to like you basically telling the brand, hey, look, I want you to stock the brand exclusively in my store without anyone else can stock it. So to me, that's kind of toxic in a way. But at the same time, it's also you need that, you need um, that protection, right? Because like, you know, you want that exclusive rights of having that particular brand. Mm. Um, I think that's, to me, just creates that sort of rival, that's a lot of that sort of, you know, fighting and people just want to get, like if there's a particular brand that's hype, for example, everyone wants to get that brand. And it just became really doggy dog kind of world. Do you find you have to like sign the bigger your brand gets signed these exclusive deals or that's more in the early? I guess like the higher you are in the ranks, the yeah. more you get, a, you get a say. And for us, as we learned that through just grinding year to year, this is our 10th year, 11th year now. And at the beginning, we have to almost like beg to get the brand, but now the brand comes to us. What have you found, Ty? I think in the fashion community and in fashion brands and whatnot, it's so toxic that like people don't like to share information and um, help each other out in that sense. And obviously, you know, like on the bigger scale, you know, the big brands don't talk to each other like that. But on like a smaller scale, you know, in terms of Australian fashion and stuff like that, brands don't communicate and they don't give out their secrets. And even, you know, people starting up don't have access to that information. Like it's all it's almost like, you know, oh, you got to go learn it for yourself kind of stuff. Um, which it makes it really hard to kind of break into the scene if you're you know you don't know anything and you don't study fashion saying that i'd say there's like a big shift away from like traditional uh pathways that are like studying fashion um but yeah i just i found that so bizarre when i was like getting into it just asking people you know like how do i do this you know like can i get some advice on this and everyone's just kind of like Right. Oh, you got to um, you got to learn that for yourself. And I'm like, uh. but to be fair, though, it's so much easier now. Mm. Yeah. Like you know, back then, like we we there's no Google, there's nothing, so we have to find a resource. Like and people, sure. hey, like, they're help protective, like which factory they're using. But now you can just Google clothing manufacturer. You get tons of them. Yeah. Or how to start a brand. There's like it's millions like of videos on TikTok, YouTube, and it's like when people come, like, hey, do you start a brand? Like, bro, have you tried Google? Yeah. And to me, it's kind of like you haven't done your homework yet. Yeah. So, I mean, it's right now is yeah. way, way, way easier than before. Do you find it, that's more um, a product of being in a small environment like Perth, that scarcity mindset, as opposed to say if you're in London, New York, and Paris, and you're on your way up? Do you feel like the same? You go through the same stuff, or they're more collaborative? I think bigger the city, the more. Work for it. I think it's man like right now we're, we're in a yeah. digital age where everything is so small mm. everyone's using the same factory like everyone knows which factories they're using you can literally there's like resources everywhere where back then like you know if you if you um, in Melbourne or Sydney or Paris and London you get a better chance of finding these big factories like the main factories um, but now it's man you can be in in India or <laughs> wherever like India now has a crazy factory and if you can be in the smallest town and still be able to make a brand. This is how easy it is to start a brand. That's not, the, the question is like how hard it, like the, the hard thing is maintaining or creating, making money um, out of creating the brand. How do you build a successful brand? There's, that's the key, right? And people like always want, to, they want to be the next Louis Vuitton, the next Supreme or, um, and they release a collection, for example, up from, they launch their brand, but they don't really have enough money enough capital to keep it going so they get 
disheartened from not making enough money from that first collection. And what happened is that collection just keep dwindling and you just have this debt stock that doesn't sell and that kills the brand. So one, you need big capital. Um, like if you don't have big capital, it's going to be very, very difficult to maintain your brand. Um, especially now, you have so much comp like so much competitions out there. Um, if you're not a Kanye West, Kim Kardashian, um, if you don't have like almost like hundred grand to start a brand, it's your brand will probably only last three to six months or eight months. If you're lucky, you can maintain it. If you mm -hmm. say, for example, you crack the code and you you um, create this product, it all comes down to product, right? The product that no one has, no one ever wanted, and yeah, you can make millions of dollars. And you can boom, but that's a unicorn brand. So if you had a pretty decent personal brand, say, whatever, let's, let's just throw, say, 100,000 um, followers on Instagram. You had a pretty, pretty good personal brand, and then you thought, you know what? I'm going to go into fashion. So they've already got a very good easier. Yes. Way easier. Um, how much money do you reckon they would need to start to do well? I reckon 20 At grand. At least 100 grand from like 20 grand won't get you 20 enough. grand to start your first product and sampling just to be safe. But if you were to go with your big, Again, like, big scale up, then yeah, 100 grand. But I would say if I you want to be serious on it, if you want to make that your full time mm -hmm. career, 100 to 100 to a million dollars. No, I mean, he's talking about like this first startup kid that first wants to start, do it. Yeah. So 20 grand was like when I started. 20 grand would be enough, but yeah. still you, you gotta, you gotta keep investing in back into, yeah, your 20 grand is only gonna produce your first collection, mm. right? You gotta think about four collections after that. I think that's what a lot of people don't realize about mm. fashion and the cyclical nature is that, you know, you're not just making one collection and then, you know, you sell that out and then you make the next one. You have to constantly be thinking about what's mm. coming forward. And that's where cash flow comes in because you know, you can have your, like one collection can do amazingly, but then if the next one, you know, let's say it only half sells, um, and now you're missing that capital to go to the next collection. Now you've put yourself in like a bit of a, like a rut between them, you know, and that's where you need to inject your own cash flow to kind of make up for it for the next one. And that's, it's, it's a challenge, I think. And that's what a lot of brands fall into is, you know, like they'll make money and then, it won't be reinvested correctly. Um, like I've done this myself, I'm sure like the other boys have done it as well. Um, and it causes issues in terms of like the Dead growth stuff. and um, <clears throat> stuff like that for your brand. How do you, how do you find a, a factory to actually start to build your product? So easy now, man. Like literally, yeah. if you go to alibaba.com, you can find you Just go on YouTube, type in top five factories, there'll be a video out now or even TikTok. And it's I get that on my feed every day. Easy. Top ten factories. Yeah. This is where they make this. This is Supreme's factory. This is Louis Vuitton's factory. The question is like, which one are you gonna use? Yep. Then you gotta they gonna start investing yeah. money into your sampling, yeah. um, and have that's ever, the key thing. Have you ever been stitched over by a factory? Yeah, I have. Lots. I have. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was like, yeah, yeah, we very. Nice. I was very yeah. lucky when yeah. I first started because I, I hit a gold mine because like, obviously Ty uses the same factory now, and um. Yeah, well, I was just very lucky. I went on Alibaba, saw the first thing I saw was like the sportswear. And then I was like, oh, that looks pretty cool. Make, they make some stuff for like some US like stores and whatnot. Gave it a shot and then I've been working for like three years. But then after that, you just outgrow that factory. You want to do like a bit more higher end stuff. So yeah, that's just how it goes usually. There's a lot of um, sampling involved like when you're choosing your factory because every factory has their specialization you know in terms of one might be sportswear and one streetwear mm. one's high end you know stuff. stuff like that and they will offer like a range of products but they won't all specialize in all of them and you know it, it means that every factory won't be perfect for what you need it for you know they might be really good at making one product and not good at making the other um and also like you know, a good factory for me might not be a good factory for Ed or Sil because, you know, we want to use different fabrics and, uh, you know, the way that we want to make it, the quantities, whatever, could be different. So there's a lot of trial and error. Like I have a story that I always tell people from a few years ago where I sent the exact same tech pack to like five factories all at the same time and I received five different T-shirts back. <laughs> so it's just, it was like a reminder that, you know, like one people don't always follow like the instructions that you give them but to that you know every factory kind of offers something different and some are uh, pay more attention to detail some are more lazy and they're just hoping that you don't realize um but that, i guess that's part of the fun of it you know and 
like I was saying earlier, factories, um, that's something that people don't like to give out, like their personal factory. Um, even though, like so easy to find them like online. But like if you were to ask someone like who do you, who makes your stuff, like they're not gonna like tell you usually. I feel that because you've spent like $500 yeah. on sampling and you don't want to just give away yeah. that yeah, secret, right? Like, That's part of the reason like, like yeah. when people come up, hey, where'd you get this shit done? Bro, Google it, do your research, yeah. do your homework before it comes to me. Yeah. Right, and then if once you've done this, and if you have problem with scaling and all mm -hmm. that stuff, then yeah, well, I can help you out, I can mentor you. But when people are just like, hey, how do I start a brand? Where, where'd you get your stuff made? So and trial and error. Right. And it's it like asking a chef, hey yeah. man, what's your recipe? How'd you cook this, bro? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Like, I ain't giving this you this really good. Yeah, how I, feel long like you every, yeah. I feel like everyone just wants the easy way out. Like, oh, definitely. Yeah, for like sure. I, it took a while. Like obviously, us, all, all of us work in the same office now. Like. We've, I've seen the boys grow, so we I actually don't mind sharing them what we do our things because we all know, like I've seen them work for it. So it's like okay, once you've worked for it, then we'll we'll talk. Well, I think a lot of it as well. It's like um, if you feel like someone's committed to something, mm, exactly. and they're putting it and they're on the path, and you connect with them and you like them, you open up more. Yeah, for as sure. opposed to someone you just like, just, you're just fucking lazy. Yeah. And, 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 and you most can tell just talk. who's doing this casually, part time or full time. Mm -hmm. You know who's actually doing this putting everything into this this is their do or die do you know what i mean and some people just kind of like look if you like i said i always say like if you're putting your your brand a part-time um effort you're going to get a part-time result All right so how do you how do you deal with these factories in terms of the language barrier in terms of getting better deals negotiating better terms if there's issues all these things because imagine there's some of the deal makers and decision makers wouldn't be speaking english yeah well i pretty much manage the production the production for banks and cabbers so how that goes is they have they actually have pretty good people that can speak english like they, in china they've got like the best like translators or even like just people that speak hi dear english. hi dear they always yeah, call they it hi dear <laughs> like, honestly they can speak better english than majority of the guy australians i know like, unfortunately like they just they're very well spoken over there um, but yeah, they, they've got someone that does the, that job and we're lucky, we're, we're lucky to actually speak to them. On, on and they're the really level. good. They work till night time. They work a lot harder. They go on WhatsApp till night time. Yeah. yeah. Like like nine I'm to the 9 PM. Yeah. 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 It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Good. <laughs> What's harder to build a streetwear label or, or a, um, activewear label? Uh, we just started an activewear <laughs> brand and I see like the future, there's a active is such a big market and i know a lot of my friends made millions and they, they scale like crazy yeah first of all active where now especially nowadays um post covid season uh co post covid it's not just a uh com like in you know, a luxury commodity like well oh, like i'm gonna buy one gym where no they need it like they buy it every week because mm. i need a new thing new new clothes especially to train in five different outfits. especially yeah. in women's wear women's, women's active wear yeah. Ooh. The girls buy scrunch leggings like no yeah. other. It's a lot every, easier to sell to a female days. market than a male market. It's, yeah, that's yeah. females are way easier. They, they, they just love to shop. Unfortunately, Activewear is all about like when you're launching Activewear brand is about how how well you market the brand. And quality is definitely given, you know what I mean. But most Activewear brands produce from the same factory or similar factories, so quality is kind of like everyone's playing in the same field. It's about the marketing, who's wearing it, um, what influencers wearing it. Do you know what I mean? Especially if you've got a big activation a community. Big influencer who's if you've got a community. It. Yeah. It's all about the lifestyle now it's with active wear. Yeah, you gotta build that you community. See the Pilates, first. Gym or what's the what's the other one? The light, uh, fashion. I think fashion is fashionable side now for active wear. So all three of you, I guess you're in the street wear space. Mm, but you've much. all got a different brand, even though you're all working in the same office and do do things differently. So how do you come up with what your brand means to customer and how do you develop the lifestyle associated with it um for me it's always been like you know i don't i, I don't like the word streetwear it just kind of like so um widely used and now it's just like when i hear streetwear it just to me it's like a cheap wear yeah <laughs> cheap lifestyle wear right because it, you know like and i wouldn't say cheap it's more like accessible you know i hate using the word like cheap as well like accessible because there's tiering do you want McDonald's or you want Michelin star? Mm. You can, I mean, I look at Louis Vuitton now is basically a streetwear brand. They do like basically streetwear is, you know, brands that you um, do t-shirts, hoodies and crew necks are streetwear. Louis Vuitton never used to do it. Now they do it. Um, so for us, it's about like, what I always say is like, how do we sell the products emotionally? Right, so like, if you don't have a strong branding, no matter how good quality is you're producing, no one's gonna buy it. 
right? And that's the key. Like, you know, you got to build that emotional connection. When we establish that brand, like, all right, this is a, a very, like an expensive t-shirt. Now I get people wearing it when they go out for like, say when, when I see kids like, I, I just finally bought my first Cabin Noir t-shirt for my 21st. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? They're really, really building up to that. That was my last and one. So, huh? <laughs> it's yeah. a special moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, <laughs> I'll wear this to the gym. Uh, Do you know what I mean? So like, it's, up. <laughs> it's like Louis Vuitton, right? For example, yeah. um, uh, how, do, how do Louis Vuitton build the brand? It's like, they don't, mark, like Louis Vuitton has accessible range, like, um, you know, they're- Entry level. Uh, entry level, like mm-hmm. belts, um, whatever, perfume, uh, keychains, right? Some Hats. Places. But why do their people think it's a, a million dollar bag, crocodile bag, hundred thousand dollar trunk brand? Because that's how they promote. That's how they market it to the the mass market. Like uh, we're a hundred thousand dollar trunk brand, crocodile, a million dollar crocodile bags, luxury. So people want a piece of that by buying the cheap stuff. Mm. You know, I'm like I'm wearing a Louis Vuitton cap. I feel a million dollars now because I'm part of that brand because they they've already established that emotional connection to the market, and that's the hardest thing when you um, launching a, a brand. I feel like. Definitely. In terms of what would be advice to a startup? Don't do what I did. <laughs> what do you mean? I uh, spent money on the first drop on my car. Should have put that back into the uh, <laughs> business. <laughs> Only yeah. bands. Yeah, like, put, like, the like, car the seal, seal, Dude, Back what? then I was like, I was like a fresh 19 year old, 20 year old kid, made my first 10K from, from like, you know, from clothes obviously. And then I was just like, Oh, I could buy some car parts. Damn. Yeah, I got my exhaust and then and I was like, wait a minute, I should just put that back into the business. But he makes mistakes. He was eating me for the next you? three years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when did you realise that? When did I realise that? Oh I wish it was sooner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we all make those mistakes and then uh, I'm glad Imran came in in like my second or third year of the brand and he was just like, I'm gonna manage the accounts and I'm gonna make sure you don't do the same mistake. This is the thing, do. like no one really teaches you, give you a blueprint. You can't go to school how to start a brand. Nah. So you go to fashion school and even these fashion designers who graduated, like wanting to start their own brand, they still don't know where to go. Like I know how to sell, I know how to create collection, but like business structure, mm-hmm. no one teaches you how to like, all right, how to um, work your capital into production, into sampling, into next collection, into marketing, into so on, so on, so on. No one really gives you that. You have to learn it yourself the hard way. There's a lot of different vehicles you can yeah. do it. And, and a lot of that's like self-awareness, capital, <clears throat> mm. different things. Because if you don't have much capital, you've got to be pretty resourceful. I've seen Will Smith, like he had a brand um, for one collection. It just it failed straight away. And that's Will Smith. I didn't know he had a brand. <laughs> you know, he had a, a brand called Bel Air. One season, gone. Oh, and that's yeah, Will Bel-Air. Smith. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, unless you're a Kanye West, and even Kanye West has this moment of the brand collapsing. So yeah. how do you build a, a, a brand with longevity? That is the million dollar question. What are your thoughts on Kanye? I love him. <laughs> Honestly, people just hate him because the mainstream just is told to think of him like this. But if you know him through his journey, like I respect him as a, like a creative and also an artist. Um, Why do you think people hate him? Because they just don't understand him. That's the thing. They don't understand the type of person he is and how he got there. Um, like I've, I've knew him before the documentary that came out and it all just made sense why he is the person he is like because of his mom you know his mom was like um, in this world you just have to be yourself and it doesn't matter what people think of you like like sorry for the language but like say like fuck everyone you put yourself first and that's what he did I think it's just because he's so real and authentic and it's yeah. just too confronting but that's, that's, that's the same yeah. thing as Taylor Swift right how is Taylor Swift so big because she's so open with her lifestyle, her relationship, her life. People like follow it. She gets so many haters. I only just realized who she was until that the Grammy Awards and Kanye shut it down. And I was like, who's this girl? But because of that, <laughs> like, they built her after, brand. After I'm, that, I don't know her name blew up. It. Like everyone's yeah, like, who's Taylor? Yeah, like, every I was time like, she, they talk bad about her, <laughs> her brand blew up. Same with Kanye. Yeah. Every time they shut him yeah. down, every, his brand blew up. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's just how it works. That's how it works. I think the one common thing a lot of brands have, whoever it is, is that it's like longevity over time. Mm. You can't build a brand in like two years no. or three years. You can, yeah. but you just, it's yeah. The first three years is easy. After that, it's like, like, we've been doing this for 10 years now. Yeah. The first three years was like fucking golden. And then after that, it's just like trying to keep it 
going that's the hard part like after that two years three years you're like oh shit like what do we do now yeah. I, I mean i oh, sorry i was gonna say i think it comes down to finding your where you fit in the market and mm. really being unique in what you offer you know like it's so accessible to create a brand these days that you know like if you don't truly stand out like you can have your moment and like you said like you know you could have one two three years where you go off but then you know when the hype dies down if you don't actually fit in somewhere you know you get exposed for that so i think like that's the biggest thing for brands is that you have to know where you actually sit, um sit and you're not just like riding a trend you know like self-awareness exactly fashion is all about trends and like you can ride the trend but if you if that's all you are is like just that then um you get exposed for it do you reckon most fashion designers are just flexing for the gram a lot of them <laughs> absolutely we're in fashion you know what's yeah. the point if you're not in like this is what i didn't get people are like oh you know you're showing off like the fashion is just for you know external beauty yes that's what fashion is you know we feel good when we look good and it's always been like that mm. do you know what i mean like why people putting a lot of effort trying to look good like oh man like you know there's a the whole debate with like oh bill gate doesn't wear this and well he's not in fashion he's not interested in that he feels good by building an empire mm. we feel good by creating something like same thing with chefs right um, chef loves cooking that particular food. They take pride in it. Do you know what I mean? It's a and creative outlet. It's yeah. a creative outlet. Yeah. If you value a bit creativity, yeah. you it can express it many ways. Yeah. There's a funny meme where it's like, <laughs> um, when someone sees you in your grocery run outfit, um, <laughs> like out in public, because it's like you know on the gram, obviously you're posting your best fits. It's like I'm not wearing that every day. You know, like when I'm going down to the shops, I'm wearing like socks and slides and like. You know, I'm wearing Maybe a hat a to like of. cover my hair and shit. <laughs> so, yeah, it's like fashion is yeah. flexing for the gram, to be honest. What's the biggest myth of owning a fashion label? That you make money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much. Um, How many people, okay, what breakdown of people who start a label, do you reckon it even break even? Mm. Let alone make money. Do you know the... um? the expression it's like you know after five years 90 percent of businesses fail and then after the next five years 90 percent of those fail i feel like fashion is that but like amplified Absolutely. even just in the perth space you know like we're talking micro brands here but how many brands have popped up and disappeared in the last like five years that i've been a part of it it's like it's so it's happening all the time um, who's the most famous person that's worn your clothes? I think it's Jay Z. Jay Z bought for, our for stuff. Cab? For, for Cabin Noir, Jay Z bought our mm -hmm. stuff. John Jones recently won us won our stuff, which is awesome. <laughs> French Montana won our stuff. Yeah, saw that. That's um, huge. For Banks, it'll be it would have to be Gunner. Gunner. Yeah, yeah. He came into the store for Cab, and we just gave him a whole bunch of hoodies. Um, and then it will be who else is worn our stuff? Mask Wolf where Mask Wolf yep. wore our stuff too we've had a few artists to be honest like mainly like music producers like Abstract um yeah this is, honestly there's too many <laughs> I, just, I just can't name it but that's probably the most so when when you um, like speaking of once you actually start getting more eyeballs and that sort of thing how have you found um, how have you found your friendship group has changed towards you from when you started <laughs> to where you are now I mean, I've got a big friendship group, but I have nice. like them in layers. <laughs> it's like a, it's like a bullseye dart, you know, the outside circle into the middle circle. But my real it's friendship, like, like it's, here, the it's cool, a, it's is like the cool group. My core cool group, my cool group. inner circle, my bullseye group. I call bullseye it. group. My bullseye group. It's probably like five, ten people in there, comfortably. How how has that group changed from when you started to where you're at now? I was having a saying like, you know, there's a, a b boy breakdown group called DSD One. It stands for Down Since Day One. And I've always remembered the DSD ones. Do you know what I mean? It's like the people who knew me from back then, before the Cabin Noir, like, you know, the brand and stuff like that. Um, and that's the one I kind of appreciate. I mean, yeah, it's fine. Like, I meet a lot of people through the brand, through the store. But, you know, that be I, I keep that into a different group, into my day oneers. Mm. How do you guys delineate who comes into your circle? I mean, I think it's you have to like we're getting older now you know and you can't just be friends with someone you know because you saw them on a night out anymore at least me personally you know like 
that's when you start using the word acquaintance, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but you're also in the um, nightlife DJing scene where yeah, people are gonna name yeah, drop you exactly. every single time. Um, but I think <laughs> like the people that have, you know, that do kind of come into my friendship circle, you know, it's when you kind of realize that you have similar values, you know, they have similar interests to you in terms of, you know, for me it's either fashion or it's DJing, something related to that. Um, and also if someone really wants to get to know you, you know, they'll, they'll be persistent and it's a bad thing, but it can also be a good thing. You know, it can show you that they, you know, there might be someone to stick around. Um, so, but to be honest, my circle is tiny. Like I don't hang out with almost anyone. Would you do business with a friend? I have before. Oh, and yeah. I think it makes it very difficult. I've, or I've done it multiple times. Actually, I used to run nightclub events with my friends. Um, way back um i've had friends invest in my business before um i think it can get very hard to you know like draw the line between friendship and business and that kind of stuff so my uh going forward like i'm keeping them separate but yeah what about you <laughs> it's a hard one because it's you have to be very i think very clear on your your value what you add very clear on your personal values and the business values and whether you actually need someone That's i think true. if you don't need someone you don't do it at all and even like taking equity and things like that i think you try and every business is different i'm small scale like small no it wouldn't even be a small scale business would be zero to 50 staff not not when once businesses get massive then obviously equity is quite different but um, I would always hold on to the equity I can unless and only get someone on board if that added a lot of value to the business. Yeah, so if, and that'd have to be very value aligned with me, but, but a different complementary skill set as well. I wouldn't want a person the same as me. There's no mm. point. No, that's a great a, way to put They don't it, add yeah. any value. For sure. Like you want them value aligned like you, but you don't want them to be like, you know, have the exact same strengths as you. If you're like full creative and risk adverse and um, you want to build your mastermind group right like, yeah yeah uh, yeah like, if you feel yeah. like big thinking visionary like you know most of us are all very like that ceo creative um visionary like if you have someone as your running buddy you probably want someone who's like meticulous detailed organized fucking all over numbers yeah. that sort of thing and even then i don't think you need to be in business for them you can hire them <laughs> as well like i think and that's the thing if just there is the, what I think is the wrong way of doing it is having this like, you know, you have two young guys. Oh, let's start a business together. Yeah. You're fucked. Because <laughs> <laughs> this is the scenarios. I'm a bit, yeah. a bit older than you guys. So it's like you see it all the time and you have two guys, they'll start a business and then it'll start growing. And then it's like one guy's actually got the talent. The other guy's actually not that talented. Yeah. But then he's got 50% of the business. And then the one guy's got the drive and the talent, he's driving it. And the other guy's just chilling. Chilling. Chilling, collecting the cash, the stopping the growth of the business, yeah. and then the guy who's who's like driving it, and he's the talent. He'd be like, "Fuck, I'm gr I'm grinding." So, so then that resentment builds builds within the relationship. And unless I think you can get that person out and pay them out mm. early, it's pretty. It's gonna you're gonna have like a relationship full of resentment, and um, so you gotta be very clear. And even yeah, you could have two guys that are both pretty driven, and then they hit their 30s. One guy's like, "I want to have a family." I'm, I'm going dad mode now. And the other guy, oh, you can, you can hustle and, and do all, all the grinding because yeah. I just want to, like the people, people change in different seasons. Yep. You could be in the first five years of your business and you guys could be single or just have partners and you can grind and do big hours. And then it's like family man. And then the guys, and the guys partner's like, no, no, you can't, you can't keep doing this shit anymore. You got to pull back. And he's like, okay. Oh, I've got 50% of the business. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty cool with where it's at. Whereas the other dude's like, no, nah, man, I want to grow this way more. Mm. So I think that's where you got to be aligned with your vision of where it's at and, um, and talk about stuff like, you know, do you want to have family? Do you want to have kids? When you have family, what do you want to do? And know that is this business a 10-year project, 20-year project, or is it a... Especially sure. when the engine's well, starting to kick yeah, in yeah. and you're like, well, is we've got a, a monster truck right now. Yeah. You can't just leave. Or is it a fuck around hobby business? Yeah. If it's a fuck around hobby business, mm. yeah, do it with a mate. Who gives a shit? If you both put in... Yeah. 50 grand, you're messing around, it does it like, you know, makes a bit of money and you know, who cares? But um, I think if it's something of significance that you're gonna put into, I'd be very, very, very cautious and reluctant. 
and it's hard because you don't want to ruin a friendship as well yeah because you know you, you, have, you can count your like really 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 good friends on your hand normally and if you go into business with one of them it can work really well mm. but it can be really fucked as well yeah so i think you got to be be careful when you go yeah. down that path for sure um yeah and just not give not give equity away easily yeah. Something I was going to tap in with earlier when you were mentioning starting a brand, I think maybe not your best friend, but like people that usually want to start a brand and especially like us three, like we're creatives first, right? Like we're not, you know, you're either business or you're creative. And I think when you're creative first, it can be very hard to have the business side as well. And so like if I was going to tell someone starting up, you know, I'd almost be like, you know, if you're a creative, find someone that can help you with the business side, um, but not someone you're too close with. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, you know, if that, if, cause that can cause the problem, but. I yeah. totally agree. I think if you're, it's almost like you have someone there, they're a business operator and then you are entrepreneurial minded and you get other people, there just like an artist. Yeah. They're good at the craft, whatever it is, whether it's, you know, being a chiropractor, being a, a designer or someone's a, whatever they're doing whether they're like they're they just so you might have someone who's just really good at that and they're fucking world class at it mm -hmm. but you put anything with business in front of them no it's a wrap they can't they can't handle it so someone like that they're the ones that commonly i find people in their circle be like oh you're so good you're so talented you're so amazing start your own business and they and, and they, they they are either very resistant towards it or they're just fucking bomb out because business you're either built for business or you're not mm -hmm. and i think if you're not built for it you have to partner with someone like this or just accept you're gonna work for someone you gotta find people who love numbers and then if you're a creative find partners who love numbers yeah so i was very lucky with me, when imran came in because he was a numbers guy because his background was in accounting yeah i was just very focused on designing the stuff and making cool shit but um yeah imran was the numbers guy and he still is to this day and i hate numbers yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 just, and, yeah. and the thing is you don't have to be good at everything no nah. because like you know how complicated a, mm. a business like what you guys have you got to be creative then you got to be entrepreneurial then you got to be have detail within the business you can have people like you know dealing with the, the factories dealing with manufacturing mm. food, dealing with so many elements to it and you don't have to be you don't I have always, to be I always good say it's all. like this metaphor it's like man it's like someone give me the sandbox and they tell me all right this is this, the amount of sand you can play with this is within that sandbox. Mm. Do you know what I mean the guys with the numbers normally would be would do that? Hey, look, you got a budget of this, don't go over budget. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Just play around with this budget. I'm yeah. like, all right, cool. Yeah. Because they keep yeah crazy fuckers like us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Too excited. Yeah. And we get focused on like the vision and growth yeah. and that. And it's good. And it's good to have that. But you need that person mm. in your just business. Just whip, yeah. yeah. They're like, <laughs> nah. And that's me. I mean, I've just <laughs> yeah. added that into my yeah. business as well because I get too too excited as well. And I'll be like, throw money in this, throw money in that. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. are you getting yeah. an ROI on that in yeah. detail? Because if you it's, don't have detail in your business, yeah. you're fucked. It's like representing like George and uh, Mike. Like Mike's the creative designer. And he does everything that is full represents branding. George is the uh, the one that just steers the ship, makes sure it's all been done, and goes out there, does all the interviews. So yeah, yeah, because it's two different brains, like a creative brain and a high detail brain. Mm, absolutely. But any Completely any different. successful brand or business, like you know, you look at Louis Vuitton. This is not even a brand; it's a business empire. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I look at it like you know, even getting a creative director like Pharrell is a business move. You know, it's not a creative move. It's a business move. What do you reckon about LeBron coming on? LeBron? Yeah. I mean, it's again, it's a business move. They, you know why? Because the NBA players have been starting to get, well, they've been hitting the fashion world for so, like for the last three, four, five years. Yep. The tunnel walk started it. Yeah. yeah. All, the, right. all the tunnel walks is just all fashion. It's all just like fashion every, launching. Every big brand want them to be seen, like the, the NBA players seen their brand worn. Who's got That's the best huge. fits? Shea, Gilgis Alexander, easily. Look him up. Russell Westbrook always had a clean like look i think they started he, he was like one of the early ones who kind of like dressed for yeah. and he was rolling he was the, the first one to actually get into the fashion mm -hmm. scene for the actual he was rolling the skirt yeah. you see when he started rolling the skirt it's dope <laughs> i love it dope you know what yeah, mean? Like, get people talking it's about it fashion, right i can't i can't do cold yeah Cole christmas outfits no. <laughs> yeah, fuck yeah. It. Like, oh, on, watch, right. so like the skirt is going to come in whether you like it or not we're going to go back to the roman the roman empire's day yeah, the guys are yeah. so. nah, he's right he's, he's going to be wearing skirts yeah. so he's got the mature style mature now, style yeah. Yeah. A bit older. No, the young guys are the ones that have the really good style in my opinion yeah um the, young, the younger nba players all the okc guys Jalen williams as well 
Why do you reckon bas- like particular NBA? Why why did basketball become synonymous with fashion more so than any other sport? I think you got to go back to obviously Michael Jordan being the first yep. uh, s- sporting celebrity, um, and then obviously Dennis Rodman mm. along with him, and then in the two thousands Allen Iverson being. I don't know if you guys know much about like mm. basketball um, fashion kind of like history, but like Allen Iverson used to wear um, sleeve. gold or well, a sleeve, but he also used to wear gold chains like during the game. <laughs> and they like street fashion. And they had, they had the banner, fashion. you know, they're like, you can't wear that. <laughs> um, and he's the one that popularized, you know, like the baggy jeans and stuff like that. So I think in America, especially fashion has been tied with basketball for like quite a while especially like hip-hop culture uh, and nba players i think basketball's been like a it's always been like a thing you know everyone wants to escape yeah real life to become an nba player yeah. you know i mean it's if you look at like hip-hop in new york right there look up to basketball first you know the bronx yeah. and walt clyde exactly and it's the first thing you think about when you look at that and then 90s jordan just took off with the sneakers I always started with the sneakers first hey jordan it's funny how like NBA players want to be rappers and rappers want to be NBA players. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh you yeah. Damien Lillard's both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Isn't he a good rapper? He's yeah. actually pretty good. Yeah. Who's this? Yeah. Dennis Rodman. Damien Lillard. Oh, oh yeah. Um, who, who, who just did a single as well recently? There's another um, famous... Who was it? Fuck. I just saw a clip and he's, everyone's like, yeah, he's actually pretty dope. <laughs> so, anyways. A couple of you boys are DJs and fashion designers. Who gets more girls, DJs or fashion designers? DJs. DJs. 100%. Why are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> Ty's a DJ too. I'm, Back I'm, in his days. But I'm, looking, <laughs> I'm looking at you still. <laughs> nah, I went, I went through under I went tight through under um, Are you asking a question to me? Yeah. Ah. Uh, well, how, 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 how do you deal with groupies? Ah, uh, I just, honestly, I actually don't, have groupies like people think i have groupies i've seen them yeah but I that's because they just come groupies. up to me and they're just like um they just want to be around me at that time and moment but i actually don't bring people out like people want to come to a club with me they can come yeah. i don't i don't the amount of people name dropping seal's name yeah <laughs> they sometimes even thought i was seal i'm like and i just go along yeah with some it. people I'm thought like, i was ed <laughs> when i had my hair blonde before i went to bali they're like hey ed and i was like i'm not ed <laughs> it's like, oh, nothing alike. <laughs> like, racist still, freak. Like, oh, oh, sorry. I was like, I'm pretty dark to you. I don't know how you got that mixed oh, yeah. up. <laughs> We've been mixed up as well. I mean, yeah, so. Ty and I, obviously, we've got the same hair now. <laughs> so he's a bit. So um, I hear a lot of like these different terms, and I only just came across this one recently. But um, what's a clout demon? <laughs> to what? Clout demon. It's, I feel like it's self explanatory. <laughs> it's like someone that's just there to be seen you know with, like yeah with the dj for, for people over 35 can you explain yeah, okay. <laughs> um someone who puts themselves in positions to be seen with other people yeah, to the uh, steal wise. their yep. their clout you know their popularity um someone that doesn't necessarily the offer you know in that space anything in particular um it's no a lot value. of pardon no value not like in general no value but you know in that instance no value so like you know it's uh, people that sneak into the green room and yeah the you know, like they don't have to be there or it's <laughs> the green room you know class. what i mean like it's it's like when <laughs> it's like in boxing when all those guys end up in the ring it's like 50 dudes yeah, yeah it's like a yeah, massive yeah, fight going cloud on. demons as well yeah, yeah, yeah just yeah, jump in the yeah. ring just to make sure they're seen on the tv <laughs> <laughs> i say the, the worst offender oh, for man. it is when celebrities from america come come here and you know like girls will often you know like kind of do anything to get in front of them and it's you know they say never meet your heroes because <laughs> when you get into that position and yeah. then you actually meet the person you realize that they're not who you think they are mm. You know, and like people will do anything to even just get in that spot. Um, that's a cloud demon. <laughs> yeah, you just see the same, same see the same group of girls with the, the new rappers that come through every season, yeah. and it's the same group this year. I already know the names of the girls. I feel like I feel like <laughs> I feel like Salt Bay is a cloud demon. Oh yeah, yeah. you see him at the World Cup. Oh yeah, and he grabbed the trophy. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty bad. That's probably mm, that's pretty who, was, who, who who did that again? Salt Bay. Oh yeah, yeah. He got fuck. He got arrested for that. See, because he didn't <laughs> That's like a FIFA cloud. Yeah, demon. he didn't need oh. to be there. Like, 
you know, why was he even on the pitch? He wasn't even meant to be on the pitch, so. <laughs> well, he had his... Sprinkling goodness. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, exactly nailed it. Is it is it hard to be faithful when you're a DJ? If you don't love your partner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, like, the temptation's there, you know? Like, you're mm. when you're in front of all the people, you know, you're the man. Yep. The way that I think of it is that when I'm DJing, like, I'm a performer first, you know? When I'm DJing, I'm putting on a performance and the people in the crowd are trying to interact with me, you know, guys and girls, and I'll interact with them because it's part of the performance. But as soon as I get off the stage, you know, that's where it ends. Not gonna lie, I've seen so many girls look at Ty when he's DJing. I'm just like, <laughs> I wonder how Karina's thinking right now. And they're just like looking at, especially this one Korean girl, she just like stands in front of his set the whole time, doesn't even like flinch. And then I'm just like looking at it, I'm like, and then me and Koo look at each other, we're like, and then the lighting guy looks at each other, we're like, man, she has not blinked. <laughs> <laughs> like, what the hell is going on? And then I was like, Ty, I think she wants you. <laughs> and Ty is like, I'm trying not to look. <laughs> What's the wildest party you've DJed at? The wildest one? Oh, man, probably it was when I was like, just starting out. I DJ one of the boys, um, he's like a moldy dude. Um, pretty boy, Skucks. He's 16, but he looked like he was 21. And he just pulled girls from all ages, I swear, like moms, high school girls. Like, honestly, like I went to his party to DJ. He was like, yeah, it's my 16th. I'm like, cool. I rock up, and it's, a, it's my brother and I. And I look around, I was like, where's the other dudes? He's like, he's like, oh yeah, I invited some guys, but a lot of them are girls. I was like, true. <laughs> <laughs> and then another one would be when I DJ my friend's um, birthday. He's like a gay dude. I didn't know a lot about gay guys at the time, but I didn't realize they had a lot of girls that were friends. So I rocked up. It was just girls. It's no dudes. And I was like, wow, this is probably the best party I've ever DJed in my life. <laughs> at the end of that night, <laughs> uh, I was tame, all right. But back in my days when I was like, just started DJing, like, I was a very shy guy. Like, you don't see the seal that you see now. Did you learn more about gay dudes or not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. Uh, I've, I've learned that he 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 really likes me. And I'm like, I'm a very kind dude, but I'm not a I'm not a. I don't like to be mean, so I I respect him as a as a man. I think That's we it. have very different definitions of what a wild party is. To be honest, yeah. <laughs> what about yourself? What was yours like? <laughs> I think to be honest, like being lucky enough to DJ Lawrence's um, mm. birthday at his private club, that was probably like. In terms of a surreal night that you can you can't recreate, like tell us about it. Private. <laughs> Wait, can I? I don't even know if I can talk about this. Can I? Well, I oh, it's tough because it's supposed to be like a little. It's like a private private party you like to throw. So I don't know. You don't have to talk specifics. Yeah, just say you went private DJ party. Yeah, some billionaire Unlimited. party. <laughs> billionaire party. Yeah, maybe maybe blur out the name. <laughs> so, so um, <laughs> Unlimited. Alcohol, caviar, oysters, private venue, anything, anything goes basically. What happens in the party? I stays in the party. Um, yeah. So you've all been to Paris for Fashion Week. What's the craziest thing you've seen at Paris Fashion Week? The craziest? Yeah. I don't know, it's always crazy every season. But it's just crazy how many like celebrities and like appear there at fashion shows. Do you know what I mean? They just be like everywhere. It's almost like 90% of the crowd is just an A-lister. You don't really get to see um, there. And I always have like insane private parties in the middle of nowhere. Do you know what I mean? They just, you have to travel two hours away from Paris to kind of be invited and- um, How do you navigate your way through the parties? <laughs> There's two ways. <laughs> you, you either like, get invited yeah. or you fake it like to know people there or yeah. know the bouncer there or just kind of like pretend you're somebody pretty much fake it till you make it in there but like you know most of the time it's who you know um, yeah. the connection and, and the network I kind of wish I went to the last Paris fashion week these guys went to Ed actually Fuck. took me to my wildest Paris experience last June um, we ended up in a uh, Hennessy honor the gift Is that after Russell party Westbrook? So there's like 200 people in the room and it's Russell Westbrook's brand. Yeah. So it's like him, Jared Vanderbilt, probably a few other NBA players, um, all these other 
clout demons I suppose yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then us and we're just hanging out there don't it's talk un- about Ed like that <laughs> 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 He's like, um, bro, here's the real deal, right? <laughs> but you know what? That was <laughs> Jared Vanderbilt's a cloud demon. <laughs> that was a crazy night, and me and Ed were freaking out. We're like, we always didn't get in as well because you get to the door to get in, yeah, and it's yeah. so and cool. Then there's there's probably twenty people lined up, and the bouncers are like, "What's your name?" You know, mm. and everyone's like, "Oh, I'm this person." They look, they're like, you're not on the list. And you're yeah. like, fuck. Most of the time in Paris, like, <laughs> Russell yeah. Westbrook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Russell Westbrook. Wait, what? This is Jared. Yeah, I'm Jared. <laughs> oh, no, Jared, I'm in mean, Jared. Oh, oh God. Man. So obviously there's a lot of models around in, in, in the space that you guys are in. So how do you pick up a model? I'll ask that. I'll leave that. Yeah, to leave, that to Ed. Ed. leave that to Ed. <laughs> this is my, my forte here. <laughs> <laughs> I love dating taller models. No, I mean, like, I don't know, you just treat them like normal people. You know, if you don't like treat them like models, they, you know, they'll look at you differently. Cause most guys will come up to them like, oh my God, you're so pretty. Da, da, da. You know, while I go up, hey man, like what, da, da, what do you do? And she'd be like, oh, I'm a model. I'm like, what, oh, cool. really? Like, well, I guess I can see you modeling, you know? <laughs> like, it, it's like yeah. really interested in what actually yeah. she's doing. And instead of, go, instead of like Putting showering her, face, her with yeah. like praise and you know, before you know, you go, oh, this guy's interesting. It's not like everyone else. Mm. Just treat them like humans, I guess. It's paying the game. You you find out models are actually very, very. Um, a lot of them are quite insecure because that of jobs they're question. in. I was going to say, are models insecure? The prettier they are, the more insecure they get. It's yeah. insane. The meter of like the prettiness of I've seen 12, 15 out of ten, like they act like they're ugly. Is this from dating or just actually being with models? Just being around, yeah. Just what I noticed, <laughs> what I you know what yeah. I. Because I, I found that my like my, my exes like all my exes were like insecure when it came to like their, their looks. Like you feel like I have to, I have to say they're pretty. If you don't say it, then they're like, oh, you don't think I'm pretty? I'm like, oh. So why do you think the better looking they are, the more insecure they are? The what? Why do you think the better looking they are, the more insecure they are? Because they're the ones who are fighting for jobs, right? So they, all they do is audition, audition, audition. And 99% will get no, 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 no. And there's only a certain amount of jobs available here. So the more you're getting no's, it, it's like, you know, and, and same thing with like ballerinas. They get very insecure because they want to get, to become the prime ballerina dancer. But most of the time they get the back backup dancer or the one of the crowd dancers, right? Same with modeling. Like you, there's only a certain amount of people who manage to get that runway prime spot. And then it's only like super limited amount of people who became the supermodel, you know, the Ford IMG or the elite models. Could you date a model? Well, I've been dating a model. <laughs> yeah, that's that's yeah. tough. <laughs> How's that gone? Good. So I'm like really, really good. Like, you know, um, one of them I was dating for like almost 10 years, but we just became different people. I think we were too young. Um, the other one was kind of toxic, but it was enjoyable. <laughs> it was a good experience. As all toxic experiences. It's like, a good, like you know, when you hit, you know, you hit a good drug, the ups are ups and the downs are downs. You know what I'm talking about. Like oh that, absolutely, and it very it can become very. You know what you're talking about, Sil? Sil knows too. Yeah, I've been with. Yeah, I've dated. I was fortunate to date two models, but um, I would never date a model ever again. You wouldn't? Nah, it's too much for me. For with my lifestyle, and my in my with the business, I I don't like to have that type of energy, which I've learnt. So yeah, just don't go down that route. In your in your industry, do you find it's hard to find a good girl? Well, for me, it's like people keep asking, "Why do you keep dating models?" Well, I'm in fashion, so the my options are basically the models. Do you know what I mean? It's not like I feel like there are other options. Oh, there are <laughs> yeah. options, <laughs> but the top <laughs> echelon pick. You like premium? You like premium pussy? We're also like I feel like you know if I'm in fitness, I'll date fitness girls. Yeah, you know? fitness girls too. I forgot about that. Or fitness models. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Another subset of model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fitness models, the sports illustrator. What about what about a um, a girl who's just not even in that space? Actually, that might be interesting, right? Because um, at my age now, I just feel like I've seen or met a most a lot of different types of like models. So I, it's refreshing if someone comes in, and be like, hey. Um, I just want to do my business or hey I'm interested in you know helping or something just kind of threw a curveball at my usual um, menu list basically you know it's like someone go, if I see a menu right now I go oh what's this 
caviar with prawn with lobster with wagyu. I never had that before. That's interesting. But you know, we've had the wagyu's and the ducks and the chickens and all that. So it just kind of like if if a new kind of breed comes along. <laughs> I'll be more right. This <laughs> metaphor is crazy. It sounds like you're for some scallops. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I've, you got to try experiment a little bit. Maybe yeah. he hasn't yeah. tried kangaroo yet. He hasn't tried kangaroo yet. It's a dry mate. I've tried kangaroo. It's a dry mate. Kangaroo. I've tried kangaroo. High in protein. High in protein. <laughs> I've tried crocodiles. I've tried a lot of things. <laughs> Finally, one of the things I always, always like to know with with um, people in business is is vision. So for you guys, do you see your relative businesses as something you're going to build to sell or do you have a vision of just just keep going and you just don't know where it's going to go um i think me personally i've had this thought many times um i actually don't know what i would do if i wasn't kind of doing what i'm doing now you know like regarding clothing and djing and stuff like that and i feel like in some way or another like that's always going to be something that um i'm going to be a part of my main goals right now is to um like keep building my dj brand play more interstate play international um get on some festivals stuff like that um obviously keep growing the brand expand uh more interstate like i'm it's been good but i want to get like a real good grasp on australia and then expand internationally as well um but yeah, I think it's really, I don't know about the other guys, but like being, being a creative and being like where I am right now, like I'd, I couldn't go back to a nine to five, you know, or something that doesn't, um, doesn't please me in that sense. Sure. What about you boys? Sorry, what's the question again? Is your intent with banks mm. to build it up to sell it or are you just kind of just keep plugging away? Keep plugging away. Because if I sold it, like be pretty much selling a part of me because it's pretty much the whole reason why I did banks is to not work a 95 what Ty said and to have the freedom to do what I want to do um, when I want to work as well okay. um, obviously with DJing it's different like um, I've broken out of the scene when it comes to like events like I don't play as much anymore like I used to but I am being picky where I play now like I just came up from Bali like I'm trying to get, aim for these international s- slots like tyres um so yeah it's just pretty much trying just ride the wave and just see where i can take it in the, long, in the next 10 years what about yourself Ed? i used to think differently when i was younger i was like man i want to build this brand i want to like you know build it to multi-billion dollar company da, da, da. right and then it's never gonna sell it so i missed out a lot of opportunities where i had big companies come up hey i want to put in 100 mil or whatever you know, at the time we had like a bunch of sharks came into the business at the time and I said, no, nah, I don't want to be bought. I don't want to lose my creative freedom. Looking back, that was a dumb move. Yeah. You know, like I should have just taken that money. I'm like, bruh, like, you know, I could start another thing. You know what I mean? Like I could start a bigger brand. If someone buys me out, I can start something because at the end of the day, your brand is here, just, not what you just produce. Yeah, I can tell you for a fact, we had that same opportunity with banks. Like we had um, Simon Beard from Culture Kings and he was like, we had like a meeting with him and he wanted to buy a bank for like a mill. He was offering us like 60, 40, but we were like, we we're just being too up ourselves at the time. And now I'm just thinking about, man, like we should have just taken it. Just build it's another point, brand. actually. Yeah. It's a good point. Yeah. What's, for each of you, what's the number? Everyone has a number. What's the number? You, if you offer that, you're out. 30 million, that's for me. That's the starting point. Nothing less. Probably 20 million. I wouldn't, yeah, I don't know, 30 would be a bit. Yeah, I would love 30 as well, actually. <laughs> I feel like getting greedy now. So. I know, but I was you trying to be. I was trying to be chill. Three, I was like twenty. Three, you threw thirty dollars. It's like thirty. I was like, hang on. <laughs> you're happy with twenty mil? Yeah, yeah. You're going one and a half. You started comparing the end. <laughs> <laughs> you want that Cap Noir money? Yes. Yeah, thirty mil. What about yourself? It's actually not something I've thought about a lot, but maybe mm. ten. Ten mil. Yeah. Because that's the thing. Like I, I was much the same with you. I've started my business. I've been in business 13 years and I never had the intention of ever thinking, oh, I'd build up something to sell it. I thought, you know, you just build it up, build it up, build it up. And then hopefully you start removing your involvement in it and you just have this nice business that does its thing. And then um, I guess in recent years, the more I've done coaching, consulting with people, then I'm like, 
the one pattern I've seen with very, very successful people is they build things up and they sell it. Mm-hmm. And they, they, they don't detach build it up to, with the intent of yeah, just keeping They it detach okay. quite quickly. Yeah. And that's what I learned. Like when I, I remember having a sit down with this guy um, when I first launched Capital Noir, the brand. Like, this is 10 years ago. Like, Eddie, this is what you need to do, right? So I can't remember what the graph is called. Business people would know what the graph, I think Siegfried graph or something like that, Sigmund graph. So what it is, is you build, the, you build a business in three years you hit uh, maximum uh, potential of the business and your business will plateau after third year, which is normally about four more years. And then you're gonna notice a dip. Before it dips, this is when you sell the business and you use that capital to grow up again. So your graph, it looks like, almost like you go up, plateau, dip before it dips, it goes back up again, plateau, dip, and you keep doing that. And that's what a lot of rich people do. In terms of selling equity in the business? Selling and like, yeah, making or profit, the business, right? Yeah. Making like, building the value of the business and then selling at the right time when it just plateaus, hitting plateaus, so that way you can sell the brand or the company and you can see like, hey, look, this is invested. how much we built. Same yeah, same. and it's a different mindset when you're, if you're building a business to sell it, it's very different to if you're building it just to, just to keep going. Yeah, that's and true. Keep going and keep going. And the thing is, if you do get that money, even if you got, you didn't get 30 mil, so if you got seven mil yeah. and you got five mil, you know, or you know, three mil, the thing is you can go, cool, cash out yep. and you go, I can start something else. Yeah. But look at Elon friend, Musk. You start something mm. else, you yeah. know what I mean? Like Elon Musk started with the PayPal deal, right? The PayPal mafia. And he made that money. And then he started Tesla and yeah. then SpaceX. Mm. So he's not just confined with just that no. one thing. Yeah, Unless we, you, you know, you, then you have like the unicorn case of Jeff Bezos, uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff Bezos basically like build that multi-trillion dollar company from the get-go and his vision's only been Amazon. Yeah. And how many of them are there? Money. One. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I mean, there's a shitload of people that have sold businesses for 10 mil, 20 mil, 50 yeah. mil, yeah. 100 mil. You know what I mean? But there's not many that have sold that sort of level. All right, boys. Thanks for your time. It's been awesome to get some depth and mindset about business models, yeah. DJing, all the important <laughs> things. But business models or business <laughs> and models <laughs> <laughs> separately? Synonymous. All right, well, thank you, boys, thank and you. Uh, good luck with your future endeavors. Cheers. Cheers thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Peace. Thank you.